Hello, my name is Soshin Sarafpour, and I'm here to talk a little bit about optical coherence tomography, and in particular, its application to glaucoma. I have no financial disclosures. Some of the objectives for this talk. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the OCT and it's the basics of OCT, how the machine works, uh, a little bit about the different machine types available and the different scan protocols available. Then we'll go on to the heart of the talk uh, in terms of reading OCTs and how OCT RNFLs compare to OCT GCLs, compares to visual fields in terms of reliability and predicting vision loss. We'll talk a little bit about common pitfalls and artifacts to look out for. And then at the end, we'll spend a little time talking about OCT angles and how the OCT can be useful in that respect. A little bit about the history, because history is always important. Optic nerve visualization didn't really happen until around 1851 when the ophthalmoscope was invented. Shortly after, in 1855, Dr. Von Graff probably described one of the earlier describes an earlier finding of glaucoma, noting some excavation of the optic nerve. It wasn't until around 1922 when Dr. Fuchs observed some changes in the optic nerve head and lamina cribosa that was found to be preceding vision loss, and this was kind of the first big association in terms of with glaucoma at that time. To monitor glaucoma, we have a couple of different options. First and foremost, we know that looking at the actual optic nerve helps us identify glaucomanous changes early, whether it be disc hemorrhages, whether it be cupping, excavation, notching. Unfortunately, we do know that there is some subjectivity to this, and there is evidence to suggest that there's inconsistency between visits and between different doctors as well. Even though fundus photography does allow us to take pictures of the nerve, which has been very helpful. It's still not perfect in that it's not able to capture the three-dimensionality of the nerve. We also check IOP, but we know that IOP fluctuates throughout the day, and we may be catching them at a time when there's when they're at a low IOP or a high IOP, and that it's not necessarily correlating with their IOPs throughout the day. And we also know that not all glaucoma is associated with high IOPs, but we still have to check in that respect, because we know that lowering the IOP helps. And then finally, there's the visual fields, which have been around for a very long time and provide a lot of useful information, especially in terms of functional vision loss for patients. Unfortunately, we've all heard, you know, patients complain about these being extremely boring. There's evidence to suggest that there's a lot of inconsistency between exams and that these need to be repeated to get accurate findings. As a consequence, we've all looked for an objective way of kind of monitoring glaucoma, and OCT has provided some help in that respect. So a few words about the basics of OCT. What is OCT? It's a form of optical ultrasound. So it's measuring light tissue interactions and using those interactions to, and an algorithm to generate pictures of the retinal layers, which it then kind of generates for us to look at. The light goes in, it scatters around and reflects back at different rates based off the media that it's kind of being reflected back upon. And because of this, because it's reliant on light, it does require a clear media. So if a patient has a very dense cataract or a dense vitreous hemorrhage, we won't be able to obtain very good images. So looking at this, if we look, the light is generated from a light source from the machine. The machine is shooting this light over to a splitter, which sends some light over to the tissue, where it's kind of scattered as it hits different layers of the tissue and slows down as it kind of goes through different layers of the tissue. That light comes back and goes to the detection unit. At that beam splitter level, some of the light is also sent over to a reference arm or a reference mirror, which is kind of providing a comparison and sending light back over to the detection unit. The detection unit then looks at the light coming back from both the reference and from the tissue and kind of uses the interferences to, and an algorithm to generate images for us to see. The first generation of OCT was time domain OCT. This used a broad bandwidth low coherence light source that was sent over to a mobile reference arm that created interference. At the same time with the beam splinter, it sent some of the, the light over to the tissue as well. Because it's going to a mobile reference, this is kind of where the name comes into play in that the OCT is kind of based off 
interference is being generated via time as the reference arm is moving through. The signals reflect and recombine back at the detector, and the detector uses the interference patterns generated to, to generate a bunch of axial scans, which generate the pictures that we then see. Because it's time dependent and because it's dependent on how fast essentially this reference arm can move, it, it's relatively speaking slow, but of course it does the job. We're still able to generate pictures that are reliably accurate. And slow, it's able to do about 400 scans per second. The next generation was spectral domain OCT. So this is more of a frequency-based OCT. It uses still a broadband light source, but it's now split to a stationary reference arm as well as the eye. So the reference arm is no longer mobile. Instead, it uses a spectrometer to generate interferences and uses an inverse Fourier transformation to kind of interpret this and to create the various A scans that are then put together to generate the pictures that we see. Because it's no longer dependent on a mobile reference arm, it can do many more scans per second, doing about 20,000 to 90,000 per second. And finally, there's swept source OCT. This is similar in the, to spectral domain OCT in that it's frequency domain based, but instead of using a broad bandwidth, it's using a narrow bandwidth laser or a light source that's kind of sweeping back and forth rapidly to generate the interference. It requires a high-speed photo detector, so it's a little bit more expensive in that respect. And what this detector is then doing is comparing the interference generated by the sweeping light um, and, and using an inverse Fourier transformation to generate those A scans that we then interpret eventually. As a consequence, it's a little bit faster than the previous models, and it's able to do 100,000 to 400,000 scans per second. There's a couple of different types of OCT machines, and a lot of it is just kind of based off personal preference or what pe people are used to. A lot of things like cost go into it, um, but I'll briefly talk about three of the more popular models on the market. So Zeiss uh, Cirrus OCT is one in particular. It's got a uh, it's not mobile. The image acquisition head is, is fixed, um, and you can kind of move it around a little bit with a mouse, but not quite to the extent of some, of some other models out there. As a consequence, it's a lot easier to learn how to use this. It's much more friendly to technicians and photographers, uh, but it is a little bit more reliant on patient cooperation. It does about 27,000 scans per second. It has a resolution of about 5 microns. Some argue that maybe the vessel tracing and the RNFL progression analysis algorithm is a little bit more favorable for tracking glaucoma progression, but a lot of that is uh, subjectivity and kind of what people want in particular, personal preference. Next, the OptiView. This is a, another model, again, not mobile, so still reliant a little bit on patience. does about 26,000 scans per second and has a resolution of about 5 microns requires real-time images, uh, and make, which makes it a little bit easier to get pictures on inatte inattentive patients, um, but has its own pros and cons in that respect. And finally, there's the Heidelberg Spectralis, which many people use. This is one of the few devices that has a mobile head for image acquisition, so you can move the head kind of around to get around various os obstacles. So if a patient has a large exotropia or, or a scar on the cornea, you can kind of move the the machine around to kind of get around that uh, opacity and to get better image qualities. As a consequence, it does require a little bit more experience in terms of getting used to using the machine, but it's less patient reliant in that respect. It does about 27,000 scans per second and has a slightly better resolution of about 8 microns. So in summary, there's a lot of different machine types out there and a lot of different factors that go into it, whether it be cost, resolution, what in particular you're using it for. So it's just important to kind of look at each machine and decide which one's the right one for you. A couple of words about the different scan protocols that are available. So there's two basic main types of scan protocols on STOCT machines, and then there's kind of an intermediate one that's also available. The default scan pr protocol is 3D, and this is essentially what most of our scans are. It takes a little bit longer to acquire, but it creates essentially 
it creates something that's very similar to a CT scan in that it's taking a volumetric image and creating a lot of slices that we can again kind of scan through and analyze. Our default scans like the macular 512 by 128 and the optic disc cube 200 by 200 fall under this category and essentially what those numbers are saying is that it's taking a bunch of scans um, but it's taking scans at 512 points along the x-axis and 128 points along the y-axis for the macular 512 by 128 scan and putting those together in terms of a picture. Compared to the 2D, the 2D is a lot quicker, it's a lot less prone to artifact, and that's because essentially it's just doing one, the, a bunch of scans on one sing, uh, singular spot. So it can either do that on a single line or a single circle, um, but it's basically doing hundreds and hundreds of scans on that particular line or circle to get increase the signal strength to as high as possible. As a consequence, you get a very nice picture, so it's useful in terms of generating a picture for, say, a research paper uh, or for getting through poor media because it's taking the scans to the same spot so it kind of builds up the sig signal strength so if there's something like a little bit of vitreous hemorrhage obscuring you can kind of get better images in that respect. The 2.5 is kind of a combination of the two to some degree. It's essentially a couple of 2D linear scans that are done with very low sampling density along the y-axis in particular. So the classic is kind of the five line raster. It's taking five points along the y-axis that isn't enough to generate necessarily a three-dimensional kind of view, but it's still enough to get a feel for things. And it's just doing a bunch of scans along those five points, so you still get pretty good uh, scan quality. Okay, now we're gonna go on and talk about interpreting OCT scans. So the very one of the most important things to look at is signal strength. Ideally on a serious device your signal strength is at least 8. Minimally acceptable is around 6, but very important to compare to previous scans to make sure that the signal strength is comparable so that you're comparing appropriately. Studies have shown that defocusing an image scan by about 2 diopters can result in about a 10 micron thinning on the RNFL that could be misinterpreted as progression. Similarly, a 10% increase in mean average RNFL has been seen after patients have undergone cataract surgery as well. So signal strength is very important in that respect. The RNFL analysis, the scan typically looks at around a 3.4 millimeter diameter around the optic nerve. It compares it to the normative database, and if we look at the RNFL thickness, we can see two particular humps uh, both at the superior and inferior aspects in terms of normal RNFL thicknesses. We can look at both the average RNFL or we can look at particular quadrants or even particular clock hours. Looking at the quadrants and clock hours can be particularly helpful as we approach the floor effect for retinal nerve fiber layer analysis, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But as the average thickness becomes a lot smaller and hits the floor. Different segments may not have quite hit the floor effect yet, and we can compare particular segments to look for small signs of progression in more advanced glaucomas as well. Since the machine is comparing it to its own normative database, it's important we understand what this normative database is. So it, it, the normative database for the OCT is patients that are between the age of 18 to 84, average of about 46.5. The racial breakdown is about 43% Caucasian, 24% Asian, 18% African American, 12% Hispanic, 1% Indian, and 6% mixed ethnicity. And something else to keep in mind, the refractive error breakdown in range. The refractor error, refractive error range is from patients with negative 12 diopters to about plus 8.0 diopters. It's important to be cognizant of this because the information that we deem from the machine may not necessarily be appropriate appropriately compared when looking outside of the normative database. So if we're looking at children under the age of 18 or extremely high myopes, you know, negative 13, negative 18, the comparison and the algorithm in terms of comparison is going to be off from the machine and we have to keep that in mind. The machine does generate uh, images in terms of how each segment compares to the normative database and it color codes this. 
So if the machine gives a green color, it's looking at basically the normative database. The, the patient's findings are within two standard deviations of the average in, this, in its database. So within 5 to 95 percent of patients come up uh, as a color of green. If it's greater in thickness than the 95th percentile, it color codes that as white. If it's less than 5%, but greater than 1%, it color codes that as yellow. And if the patient's findings in that particular clock hour, quadrant, or, or region of the RNFL is less than 1% compared to the normative database, it flags that as red for us. Looking at the average RNFL, it splits at the, so if we look at the RNFL thickness in particular, it splits at the temporal aspect. Um, because temporal is kind of the least important area for glaucoma, different algorithms can have it kind of split up at the, the nasal aspect, which may be more useful for things like neuro-ophthalmologists. But because in glaucoma we're looking a lot at the superior nasal and inferior aspect, we split it at the temporal. The clock hours in the quadrants may catch disease a little bit area, uh, a little bit earlier because you're looking at a particular segment. It does tend to be a little bit more susceptible to variability and artifacts, and as a consequence, is a little bit less reliable. Studies have shown that a loss of around maybe four to five for the average RNFL or seven to ten microns in the superior or inferior aspects correlate pretty well with possible progression. There's a lot of other information on the RNFL scan, so if we look at the thickness maps up here, this is the machine essentially showing us the raw data that it's gathering. And because it's looking at the raw data, red is correlated with thicker RNFL. And, and it's useful to look at these to look for different types of artifacts and, and areas of poor scan quality, such as highlighted here. Right below the RNFL thickness map is the RNFL RNFL deviation map, and this is the machine comparing it to the normative database. So because it's now compared to the normative database, red areas highlight area of, of thinning in this particular patient as compared to the normative database. And we can see that on the right eye here, this area is highlighted as red, and this area is highlighted as red compared to the normative data database, whereas if we look on the left eye, there's no real red areas because it's coming up as essentially full compared to the normative database. The machine also does some measurements of the disc, so it measures the rim area, the disc area, and kind of uses that to find an average cup to disc uh, and cup volume. It's basically using its algorithm to mark the edges of the disc and mark the edges of the cup and then defines the neuroretinal rim thickness as the difference between these points that it's kind of picked up. In terms of RNFL thickness, the map generates not only average RNFL thicknesses, which most of us are used to looking at, but it also plots um, and measures the asymmetry between the right and the left eye, and that comes up as the RNFL symmetry for us as well. Essentially what the machine is doing is it's looking at a circle and then unrolling it into a linear picture for us to be able to interpret. So if we're looking at our typical OCT machines, it kind of starts at the temporal edge where it's marked as 1. That correlates with this particular part on, say, the RNFL thickness map or any of the particular maps. And then it kind of goes around to the superior nasal inferior aspect and then back to the temporal, which is based off the other side in particular. Similarly, when we look at the RNFL thickness map, uh, it's a, a very similar type of breakdown in that respect. One thing that's very useful in terms of using OCTs is that the fact that it generates a guided progression analysis, and this uh, algorithm helps us, helps us detect and flag changes. The machine is now basically flagging abnormal changes. It's kind of similar to the visual field GPA analysis in that it kind of just highlights things for us to look for. Importantly, it factors in natural loss of RNFL over time. So when it's flagging something, it's abnormal compared to the natural loss. How does it do this? It does this in two different ways. The first way it determines progression is just by looking at event analysis. So it takes the average of, the, of two particular scans that have been deemed baseline, usually the first two, but can, this can be changed. It takes the average of those two baselines and then compares it to subsequent visits. 
if there's an average loss that's greater than expected, greater than the normal, if and it happens just once, it flags this as yellow, aka possible loss. If it happens more than once, if it happens two or more times, it flags this as red, aka likely loss. If for some reason there's suddenly an increase that's abnormal, say after cataract surgery or say after uh, in the event of you know disc edema or something like that, it flags this as purple, as possible increase. The other way it kind of looks at progression is that it looks at trend analysis, so it looks at the rate of change. So if the change is happening faster than the normal rate of change, normal rate of a normal rate of age related change, it flags this as well. So if the rate of change is declining greater than normal and it happens just once, again flags it as yellow. If it happens more than once, it flags it as red. As a consequence, you might be wondering what the normal age-related rate of reduction is as interpreted by the machine. And in the average RNFL, it's about negative 0.52 microns per year. And in the superior and inferior quadrants, it's around negative 1.35, negative 1.25 microns per year. Looking now at the ganglion cell analysis, so this is an analysis that's looking at the macula, it's a scan of the macula as opposed to the optic nerve. So if there are things that are causing artifacts at the level of the optic nerve, say myelinated nerve fiber layers or parapapillar atrophy, one can do a macular scan instead to kind of get information. Greater than 50% of the ganglion cells are in the macula, and that's why this is a particularly helpful scan. Um, it's got less variability than RNFL, we say it's a ganglion cell analysis, but really it's kind of including the ganglion cell layer as well as the IPL layer. Multiple studies have shown it to be as reliable as RNFL, and it has been shown in studies to correlate in particular with 10-2 visual field losses and can catch things that are missed on just regular OCT RNFLs, so it may be helpful to kind of alternate between this and, other, and RNFL scans. One important caveat is if you're looking at patients with macular disease, this may, like say a macular scar or macular edema, this will affect the results and these results become a lot less accurate as a consequence. So multiple studies have kind of compared RNFL as uh, scans as compared to GCL scans. So in this systemic review, it looked at 34 different studies and essentially found that although the RNFL might be slightly better, it was very, very close and essentially they, the conclusion was that the difference was small and, and relatively meaningless in, in this particular systemic uh, review. Now we'll talk a little bit about the floor effect. So in terms of any machine, there's a point where we're kind of limited by the machine's ability to detect and to analyze. So at some point with the OCT, the retinal nerve fiber layer or the ganglion cell layer is just going to be so thin that the OCT is not able to distinguish further changes or further lowering effects. And this is kind of called the floor effect. So it's essentially the max measurable damage by OCT. In RNFL, it's around 40 to 50s for the average. RNFL, but again, important to mention that though the average RNFL may have already hit floor effect, we can look at segmental analyses, so we might be able to find particular quadrants that aren't necessarily at floor effect yet, and we can track changes in those particular quadrants despite being at floor effect in the average RNFL. The GCL has a little bit lower of a floor. The floor is probably, for the average GCL, around in the 30s to 40s what studies suggest. And then the optic nerve head, the actual information and analysis by the OCT, may even have a lower floor effect than both the RNFL and the GCL, particularly the rim area. In terms of reproducibility for OCT, a couple of different studies have been performed. So this was a study by uh, that looked at 55 eyes with glaucoma, and looked at optic disc cube analyses. It looked at three scans done at the same visit to assess intravisit reproducibility, and it looked at scans done on four additional days over a two-month period to look at intervisit reproducibility. And as a consequence, after analysis, it found that the OCT was quite reproducible, both in intravisit and in intervisit measurements of RNFL and optic nerve head parameters. And it also noted that changes of 
of greater than 4 microns in average RNFL or 7 microns in the superior or inferior RNFL correlated with likely progression or change. How does OCT compare to other tools that we use? So this study looked at 279 eyes from 162 glaucoma patients over the course of 2.2 years and it looked uh, for progression in terms of OCT as compared to readings by expert ophthalmologists of the optic disc uh, as well as visual field analysis and found that OCT had a pretty high specificity of about 90 percent. How good is it at looking for visual field progression and predicting visual field progression. So this was a study by you et al. that looked at 139 patients with primary open angle glaucoma, a total of 240 eyes, and followed these patients for at least five years. So there was pretty frequent testing. Patients were tested with OCT and visual fields every four months. And as we can see based off this Kaplan-Meier survival curve, we can see that the OCT did a good job of predicting future visual field progression. So as with any machine, there's always pros and cons. So in terms of OCT, this does provide a objective form of data collection as compared to other subjective findings like you know, visual fields or optic nerve head analysis. It can pick up disease before there's actual functional loss because it's looking at structural changes. But as a con, this is not a functional test. It is a structural test. So we're not, the changes it may pick up may not accurately reflect the quality um, and functional use of vision that the patient has. There's a lot of different confounders that can play an effect, high myopia. There's a lot of different artifacts that we'll soon talk about. And these can all kind of cause problems in terms of the analysis if we're not aware of them. And as mentioned, there's a floor effect that may limit its use in advanced glaucoma. So visual field testing may provide uh, a higher degree of use in those patients in particular. Now we'll talk a little bit about various pitfalls and artifacts that can mess up our analysis for OCT. So here we can see an anterior acquisition artifact, which is pretty, which is not at all uncommon. We can see that the machine is generating its own tracing based off what it's seeing. And here we can see it's doing a pretty good job tracing up until around this point where the tracing is still okay, though it's not quite as good, but the RNFL layer is distorted by some traction and that's causing some, some changes that we can see here in terms of the overall thickness being manipulated to be a little bit higher. Furthermore, if we continue along, we can see that the acquisition and the tracking becomes very far off in that it accidentally tracks along the uh, vitreous as opposed to the RNFL thickness, and this correlates with a very, very inc large increase in RNFL that's clearly artifact. Similarly, um, it can have trouble with tracking on the posterior edge. So here we can see if we're tracing along on the posterior aspect, it's okay, it's okay, but it suddenly kind of skips a little bit and rather than tracing along where it would be ideal, it skips and kind of misreads the anterior aspect of the RNFL layer and this comes out as thinning, which is likely, which comes out as kind of a false detected progression in the nasal aspect. And here's another example of a different type of artifact, a decentration artifact. We can see that the optic nerve head here is shifted towards the right as opposed to being in the center of the scan. Because the thickness of the RNFL is directly correlated with how far away the RNFL is from the optic nerve head, this can cause issues in terms of comparison to the normative database that the OCT has, and this can cause errors in terms of that can be reflected as well. Here's another example, and this is a good reason why we should always look at the RNFL deviation map. Here we can see an outlined error. We can see along the deviation map this little line right here, which correlates on the tomogram as a line right here. We can see if we're following the acquisition that the map OCT has gotten, it does divot down right here, um, and this correlates on the RNFL thickness with a little divot down as well which the machine kind of puts out on the quadrant analysis as possible thinning. So this uh, is another type of artifact that we should keep an eye out for. Here is the movement artifact. We can see if a patient moves, if we're looking again at the deviation map, we can see right here 
that the blood vessels are not continuous, and this is because the patient has moved their eye or moved themselves uh, during the scan itself. Again, similar in concept to the decentration artifact because the thickness of the RNFL is impacted by the distance of the measurement from the optic nerve head, we're going to get errors as a consequence. Here's another artifact that we might be very familiar with, the blink artifact. Clearly here, if we look at even just the regular thickness map, we can see that the patient likely blinked, and as a consequence of that blink, we're not able to get a very good scan quality, and we're getting generalized depression on the quadrant analysis and on the average RNFL. Another common artifact that might come up and cause problems is the PVD artifact. So this is a patient who has a PVD in the left eye. And if we look at the general thickness map, we can see right here, with the area correlated to where the PVD is, the machine was not able to get scans of the RNFL past the PVD. Thus, on the deviation map, we can see it's flagging this as areas of thinning. It's being flagged as red. And if we correlate it to the tomogram, we can see kind of an area of thinning right here as well. Um, and if we look at the quadrant analysis, we can see in the infranasal com component where the PVD is, this area is flagged as possible thin as well. Other defects along the optic nerve, the parapapillar atrophy can cause an artifact defect and mess with the scans as well, causing a lot of artificial thinning in the nasal or temporal areas wherever the parapapillar atrophy is, so something else to keep in mind. And similar in concept, here's a, another issue that we can see. There's a myelinated nerve fiber layer, and that myelinated nerve fiber layer is causing some issues in terms of the ability of the machine to generate its picture and image, and as a consequence, we're getting all sorts of uh, false readings of thinning and thickening and so forth. And here we can see in a particular study by Liu et al. the importance of looking for artifacts. So they looked at 2,313 scans from 1,188 patients using the Spectralis OCT. And they found that they, at least 46.3% of their scans were associated with an artifact. So we can tell that it's very, very important for us to check our scans, whether it be Heidelberg or any other device. It's important to look for these artifacts as they can cause false readings and they're not at all uncommon. Now a couple of words about OCT angles. So looking, we can see this uses a little bit different of a wavelength and does about 4,000 scans per second. Like all machines, again, has its own pros and cons. In particular, it generates very nice pictures that can be good educational tools, uh, especially when talking with patients. It's easy to kind of show them the narrowing of the angles and, and point out structures, as well as show them the after effects after a laser iridotomy. It doesn't require any physical contact, unlike an UBM, um, and it's generally more pleasant for patients to do. It's very easy to do in, in terms of from a technician or, or phot photographer's perspective, but it is pretty good at picking up closed angles. So specificity uh, has been found to be about 98%, sensitivity lower 55%, especially compared to gonioscopy. So it doesn't mean that we don't need to do gonioscopy, but it can be used in adjunct to uh, gonioscopy. It does have some cons. It is limited in its ability to visualize tumors and ciliary bodies, and that's an area where UBM might be much more helpful. Um, it's a relatively expensive machine, and it may not get as good penetrance sometimes in terms of visualizing some particular angles, especially in longer eyes or deeper angles. It gives an objective cross-sectional view of the anterior segment angle. In terms of uh, helping identify structures, the key is to find the scleral spur, as this is at the end of the trabecular meshwork, and once you can find the scleral spur, it becomes a lot easier to identify whether an angle is open or whether an angle is not open. And this is generally the easiest way to find it. It's is following the bo posterior border of the cornea until it interfaces the line between the sclera and the ciliary body. Um, and in particular, sometimes you can see a little bit of a inward protrusion at this particular area. So if we follow the posterior aspect of the cornea, we can kind of go, go, go until we see this area where, there, where there's a little bit of a protrusion. And this correlates to the area of the white arrow, which is where the scleral spur is. It's also a little bit sometimes less reflective because it's where the ciliary muscles meet the more reflective scleral. 
and that can kind of tone down the reflectivity and that can be another hint that some people can look for. In terms of looking at narrow angles, so here we have three different pictures. The first is an OCT of narrow angles that demonstrates anterior bowing of the iris. And then we can compare that to the UBM in picture B that shows this kind of narrowing a little bit more prominently and we can see that we can the ciliary body a lot more clearly in this UBM image. Now when we repeat the OCT of that same angle in the dark, we can clearly see that the angle is quite closed off and we can see that the iris is touching the cornea in picture C. And then a couple of quick words in terms of plateau iris. Even though the OCT can't visualize the ciliary bodies, you can sometimes still see some subtle findings that may prompt you to start considering UBM. So here in photo A, it's an OCT of the uh, angle, and we can see that the iris is a lot flatter and does look a little bit peculiar. And compared to the UBM, once we, re we do that UBM, we can see that the ciliary bodies are in that plateau iris configuration. So in conclusion, OT OCT is a reproducible and objective way of monitoring glaucoma and can be helpful in that respect. OCT, RNFL, and GCL both have useful applications for detecting progression. Changes greater than 5 microns in the average RNFL or 7 microns in the superior or inferior quadrants can be particularly concerning for progression. And you should be very cautious and aware of artifact defects as they are quite common and can cause significant changes and problems. And finally, OCT angles can help us detect and monitor narrow angles and can be useful in terms of explaining to patients. Thank you very much. I wanted to give a couple of acknowledgments to some of the people that have helped me with this presentation. Dr. Krishnan for his contributions greatly to a lot of the slides. Um, and for his feedback, as well as to Dr. Christopher Tang and Dr. G. Liu for their help and contributions as well. Thank you.